This is the Your Shelf Podcast, and I'm your host, Jay. If you want to support what we do and help us keep on interviewing interesting people and talking about the best books out there, please check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash yourshelf. For as little as one US dollar a month, you can support us and access a range of benefits, the Your Shelf newsletter, early access to information about our next episodes, free books from the Your Shelf Press, and access to exclusive bonus content that didn't make it into each episode. Hello and welcome to the first episode of the Your Shelf podcast, the poetic pop premiere. Take off your shoes, grab a snack, make yourself comfortable. We've got two amazing special guests lined up for our first discussion, both friends of Your Shelf, avid readers, and pop stars who have pioneered their own distinct brand of music with their beautiful, poetic lyrics at its heart. You probably know her as the front woman of one of the most successful rock groups of the last 10 years. Florence Welsh of Florence and the Machine joins us for our first episode. A devoted reader and writer, Florence also has her own book club, Between Two Books, which recommends not only her favourite books to her fans, but also books by artists and writers that she admires, from musician Nick Cave to some of my favourite writers like Sally Rooney and Hera Lindsay Bird. A week after releasing the band's fourth studio album High as Hope in June 2018, Florence released her debut book of lyrics and poetry, Useless Magic, which was nominated for the Goodreads Poetry Book of the Year. Florence is joined by Rebecca Lucy Taylor, better known these days under her moniker Self Esteem, who released her first solo album Compliments Please earlier this year, after being one half of Slow Club for over 10 years. In addition to the sonic poetry of singles like Roll Out, Girl Crush, and In Time, Rebecca also shares her phone notes poetry on Instagram and took part in an open mic phone poetry event organised by Florence's book club at British Summertime Festival in London earlier this year. We met up with Rebecca and Florence last month in Edinburgh, where Self Esteem and Florence and the Machine were performing at the summer sessions in the scenic Prince's Street Gardens. You can expect a conversation about songwriting and poetry, secret self-help books, Limp Biscuit, Tilda Swinton's reading habits, hope, collaboration, the importance of believing and reading women, men who don't deserve beautiful songs, the work of Ocean Vuong, and how to make art out of everyday glory. So this is the first ever episode of the Your Shelf podcast. Congratulations. Thank you very There's much. There's no coming back from this. No, I know. It <laughs> can't beat this. Beginning of the end, yeah. <laughs> Talk about peaking. Um, the one-off Your yeah, Shelf. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Never to be attempted again. <laughs> We're, we are ambitiously calling this the poetic pop premiere. Emphasis on premiere, you know, the first of many. Um, but yeah, it's just such a thrill to have the two of you together. I think we're going to have a lot to talk about. And just to kick things off, we're going to start by uh, a quick lightning round, actually, of just some general book questions that I think your shelf subscribers are going to want to know the answers to. So, and you guys can just jump in whenever, whichever one of you wants to go first, kind of thing. So, <laughs> so first question. What do your bookshelves look like if you have bookshelves? How do you organize? Do you organize? Uh, okay. I have lots of piles all around the house that are sort of growing like stalagmites. But I got sad because I moved house and um, the movers packed all the books away into cupboards and it freaked me out because I couldn't see them. Like, I quite like to have all the books out so I can see them except for the self-help ones which I hide (laughs) so I have all the ones that make me seem really smart and highbrow and then the ones which are like why can't I get rid of this anxiety and my family trauma I hide away (laughs) that's right yeah (laughs) books are to look sexy right (laughs) well that's it you don't want you don't know want the book out there that's like you don't know how to love. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to my home. <laughs> it's like, Please come in, sit down. So true. <laughs> um, my, I, I, I bought a flat and moved to Margate. Like, like I thought that was going to be solve my life, and got all the bookshelves, and I was going to be the vibe of the living room. 
and then promptly had to move back to London and I'm in a tiny box room now with like the the the, the essentials just on on a just uh, a, a shelf not even a shelf the window ledge covered in ash from my secret smoking <laughs> <laughs> so uh yes uh, very self-esteem <laughs> like, that catch very on brand. Really <laughs> catching up <laughs> yeah i think i do things now and i'm like oh that's very self yeah <laughs> <laughs> like, it, it really is the follower count going down we were like it's perfect <laughs> um here's another general question for you what are the books or book that made you um i think that's quite that's definitely quite difficult to answer just I think reading in general was a huge solace for me um my mum said that I was kind of quite an energetic and imaginative child and and maybe like a bit of a handful until I learned how to read and then she said it was fine because I just was off in a corner reading and yeah I think just the act when I discovered how, like how to read, it it was sort of such a relief. I think, um, but I think a book, um, yeah, I think the book that actually a book that had a really big um, effect on me on for this tour and for this album was Hope in the Dark, uh, which is a soul knit production and she is like a philosopher a fem like a philosopher of like activism and fem- feminism and this book is so a lot of the things that I was talking about in my show like that hope is an action came from reading her philosophies on hope and she says this really interesting thing that when she's talking about hope is that it cannot be like a blindly optimistic or pessimistic thing because that just uh, validates inaction so if you just say everything is fucked it means you're just like oh well I guess it's all fucked what can I do or if you say like oh it's going to be fine they both validate not doing anything so this idea that the hope that is that hope is essential but the hope that moves us forward is one that requires action and yeah as like somebody who like all of us feels confused about how to make a difference it was also a book that like encourages like small action, action that you feel like potentially you think it's not making a difference. And this beautiful phrase, it's like hope comes in from the edges, you know, as you think everything is falling apart, there is already a revolution growing underneath that maybe you just, you can't see yet. So that book, especially on this tour was this kind of, this sort of, yeah, it was something that I could always go back to and refer to and Solnit's work is just, Oh, it's so incredible so yeah but that one was really important for this this campaign yeah thank you and what about you rebecca um what was the question made you books that made you or just books that had like an impact or that changed something yeah. for you something in your life it could be when you were a kid it can be you yeah know, anytime i did i was similar like I, I, it was like jacqueline wilson shit like like really was like i was like oh and i saw myself finally because her her characters were the were like scrappy girls that weren't like uh, fem- really feminine and stuff like that. I remember being like, oh, and then I did a lot of like making up epic like novels in my brain. Like I was so I was such a loser. I was so like, so lonely. I used to throw a tennis ball because I played cricket, right? So I like, it's like train like throwing and catching on my own, but make up like expansive like novels in my head. So my own work which made me. It's oh. weird, yeah. Like I totally. We moved, I like moved in, I'd never had brothers before and we moved into my step family's house and my eldest stepbrother was really into science fiction and I was like trying to impress them. So I would be sitting there trying to get through Dune, yeah. which is oh, like this, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I read Dune too. And then I, I think I went off and tried to write my own science yeah. fiction, but it was, I just used the same plot. I was like, there's a giant worm that comes yeah, out yeah. and then tried, but yeah, I remember that, like, but I was trying to like impress I was like living with boys. I was like, oh, okay, like I guess I'm into science fiction now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I still the, quite into science fiction. Actually. It can, it, if it's good, it's really good. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I had a character called the Babylon Sorceress. <laughs> Wow. And I could draw her for you right now. Oh my god! She had a purple cloak, bright red hair, green eyes, and like, yeah, I, that was a 
it was years of me writing oh that. Oh my god, the Babylon yeah. sorceress. Maybe that'll be where I'm like, so yeah. good. I'd read yeah. that. Please bring, Babylon bring sorry, because of Babylon Zoo. You remember? <laughs> I loved them because I was like mystical. <laughs> And uh, and like he was hot <laughs> to me. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. But the book, I, and also, I had my sort of first wave of I had a, like a very bad relationships twenty uh, twenty twelve, and hadn't sort of fucked with feminism properly <laughs> until after that. And I had to because it was so it was like classic narcissistic abusive, like all all of them. And women in room with the wolves was like someone sent me it, and I was yeah that that did actually i'm still like i read it in like sections i still not like finished it but it was my first the first time that like feminism the idea that we are we are feral and we're animals and we 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 have a right to uh, be big and loud and too much mm. and all the rest of it all the things that i base everything i'm doing now around and the flag i'm waving um did come from that but like way more poetic than that it's like a sort of poetic feminism that she i think it's because it's a translation some of it's just so no, simplistic yeah i keep and profound. trying to i get given copies of that book all the time and i keep I, I've, yeah it's I've not like it's, you, it, it's hard you, it's not like a page turner at all but like now and again i'm like i, I need to <laughs> yeah. pick it up and put it in also i, I remember at high school we did handmaid's tale of the gcse oh, so and good. that and i had like it's a so sort of horny teacher book. now when i look back and she was like she was a real like <laughs> we all like no one liked her but now i see she was just like and she was a feminist and like we'd, i'd never met one you know what i mean uh, even i mean i'm not that old but my you, you do, yeah, did you have yeah, that yeah. like i had a teacher at school that i haven't realized that maybe i based my whole life on is that at my first at primary school there was my english teacher and she used to come in in full renaissance fair clothes oh. all the time <laughs> every day like sleeves down to the ground and i idolized her i loved and she was my english i loved her so much and now i look at the stage clothes and the whole thing i'm like that had him. <laughs> it's the Babylon <laughs> sorceress. Yes. <laughs> she was like the Babylon sorceress. Um, yeah, it's funny those those people, but I'm like, it definitely stuck. <laughs> yeah. No, at the time, like we all hated that book, and now I'm like, oh wow, you know, that was the start of. I had that book in school as well, yeah. and I don't think I read. I yeah. don't think I read it like the idiot yeah, that yeah. I was at school, which was I was like over the fence, yeah. smoking cigarettes yeah. and getting drunk, and and I reread The Handmaid's Tale recently and it is so good it's so good sorry we're, no, we're no. Gonna be here for hours <laughs> that's fine <laughs> if you could have any one person living or dead recommend a book to you who would that person be and why i don't need them because i have you <laughs> <laughs> okay that's definitely going to be like our promo <laughs> clip <laughs> why do i don't know what tilda swinton reads yeah. before she goes to bed tilda talk to us <laughs> That's what you're reading. I want to know if she has to check her phone <laughs> whilst <laughs> reading, like I do. What? So, so, yeah, yeah. I'll go. With, I'll go. <laughs> we both. We both want yeah. Tilda. Tilda for the win. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll, she have? We'll contact her Instagram. people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know Freddie Mercury. I want Freddie Mercury. Oh yes, yeah. that's good. I want to know what he read. It would be probably something really boring. Do you know what I mean? Like just in complete He's antithesis. Just having too much sex and fun and <laughs> to it, like, yeah. Read. You know the self esteem logo is based around his uh, signature. No way. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> like you wouldn't. That's know. so self esteem. I think the best place to start is. Again, the title of the pod, this episode of the podcast is the Poetic Pop Premiere. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about songwriting versus poetry. You know, when you sit down to write, do you know you're writing a song or a poem? Or like, at what point does one become one and not the other? Do you know what I mean? Well, I mean, the first things I really like, remembered when I, when I, the first things I started writing when I was a kid was was poems. Uh, and I've still got them. It's like a tiny notebook made out of recycled corrugated cardboard. And it's like funny poems about like polar bears and Coca Cola. Which <laughs> 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 is like, yeah, like really weird kid stuff. But um, 
and you could already tell I was a genius. <laughs> you should get that in tiny. Yeah, <laughs> get a run of it. So I put, I got, it was something like to trying to encourage people to put coke hands in the bin. I mean, it's like quite, um, and, but I think I was about when I was about eight or nine, was, that was writing poems in um, the songs thing. It's funny because I would write a lot before there was actually any music. I think a lot of it was kind of like poetry, but yeah, the first songs that I wrote were these really sort of intense gothic fairy tales. And it's funny that the way that you make something does sort of inform the lyricism of it, because when I started to make the music at the same time, let's say Dog Days is fragments of lots of different pieces of um, notes I just had scrapped around. So the songs had, when I was writing separately to then make the music elsewhere or make the music, because when I was like working with guitarists, I can't play guitar, I would go off and write the, and then actually when I sat down and started making songs on the piano, it changed the way that I was making it. It became a bit more, I kind of scrapbooked things together. So Dog Days is like the title of an artwork I like mixed with jumbled up bit of notes from somewhere else. And you sort of just threw them all together and it created a different kind of song basically that essentially doesn't make any sense, but it all evokes the same feeling. Uh, But I was very insecure about um, the lyrics and I sort of understood that something sung had more you could give a reverence or a sort of spiritual meaning to something that was probably quite mundane if you just saw it on a page that if you sung it it could be sort of transformed so I wouldn't I didn't let any of the the uh lyrics in the liner notes I've never had them in the in the sleeve notes of the cds or anything like that because I was too yeah nervous to see what they would look like just written down as too self-conscious too self-critical um which I think now maybe was a shame because when I was growing up I used to sit there with my headphones on and the liner notes out and listen to things like obsessively and read the lyrics and that is why I still know all uh the words to Limp Biscuits break stuff <laughs> Oh my god! That's so weird. <laughs> this morning I was googling Woodstock '99. Because you listen to that podcast? No. Oh, oh my I'm god! Break yeah. stuff. The yeah, podcast. Yeah, yeah. It is. Yeah, it's That's so such interesting. A weird thing. Yeah, it's just one of those days oh, where you don't want to wake up. Everything is fucked. Everybody sucks. You don't really know why, but you want to justify <laughs> ripping someone's head off. No human contact, and if you interact, your life is on contract. Your best bet is to stay away, motherfucker. Yes. It's just one of those days. <laughs> I know the whole thing. Oh my still. god! And, but it's so. If you think it's quite interesting that like a young, I was so young, and that yeah, was the sort that of was music what, I was really yeah. attracted to. It was Same. Very male, New metal. very yeah, aggressive. Angry. And then if you listen to these like podcasts, especially this Woodstock one, they were like, it was not that safe an environment for yeah. young women and you're like oh that was so what I was into and I was going to those gigs yeah, yeah, and, same. I mean it felt dangerous when I was there because I was like 13 nothing happened but you could sense that you were interloping yeah. on a space that was not for you yeah. for you it was like deep breath go into a mosh pit yeah. and like I would not do that now I don't think like I don't know I I wanted to just be out of the rope. I don't know yeah it's uh, a sort of energy expelling energy thing that now I'm like, oh, well, you, why are you doing that? Like, so, <laughs> well, sh- I, be quiet, stand, stand still. <laughs> yeah, it was. I think it was also there was. Um, it was almost like I never felt like pretty in the way you're meant to be pretty, and I felt like so it was. And there was this weird split, wasn't there? There was in that time it was either like super pop or you went grunge and new metal and if you were super pop it felt like maybe you had to be as pretty as like those people and I never felt like comfortable enough and there was almost a liberation from this idea of classic like prettiness when you like no I'm I dress like a 12 year old skater boy now (laughs) I miss that Oh, we're watching that video this morning. I was like, oh, this music was awful. <laughs> no, but I was listening about the first but album I, I bought was Green Day's Dookie. And I had a Coca-Cola CD player. And I was listening back to it 
but there's a lot in just those really simple three chord progressions that I think I yeah. use still like the Im the kind of emotion the, the like the sort of angst in there and the fact that it's so simplistic I think I mean my music that I definitely the music that I write myself is incredibly simplistic because like same yeah I'm an enthusiastic amateur when it comes to playing yeah and that I think that's where lyrics become that makes it possible for me to go well I'm a songwriter because for years I felt very embarrassed by my level of musicianship like uh, in terms of instruments but I always could write I could write a song to with nothing mm. um so for years when I was in a band in an indie environment it felt like I wasn't a songwriter even though I was like it was oh, crazy God, yeah like that for so, yeah you and you it's so it's like, not true. And you don't even need chords. But really. you also don't need to explain yourself either. And I just felt there's such insecurity that I was always trying to either like explain that I wrote the songs or how yeah, I did I'm it. Still and you're doing it. And you feel like you have to really spell out mm. how you do it because you think either people are assuming you're having it written for you or I mean, because they can't, especially for me, like people aren't seeing me up there playing anything. Yeah. So. But yeah, it's, I had, so, I I've sort of feel like I've calmed, I'm a bit more relaxed about it now, but I definitely like felt very stressed for a while because if, so say I would write a song and I would do the piano and I do the drums, albeit badly, and then someone would help me get, help, have to help me get it in time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, um, but it still comes from you, isn't it? But, but then if a male friend, would come in and say do a part like add a like a little section or just add an instrumentation on the top then if our names it's this if our names were put together on the credits I knew that there was this unconscious bias where people would think oh he wrote it and she just did the lyrics or the melody or whatever and it, I was so insecure about it I, th I thought I was fine about it and more relaxed now certainly because i'm finally realized as a solo artist but <laughs> there's this um, podcast about slow club album that, that they dis discuss it's like and i thought don't listen to it <laughs> and then i did listen to it and there's a girl on it who i know like i don't know her but she basically says you know she assumes that charles wrote everything and i and and certainly the way everything sounded came from him and i and I, I really i'm still i mean clearly i'm fine <laughs> but, but i and she she comments on my instagram and i'm like yeah, i just I don't think it's either just you. like men thinking you don't write it's just no. a societal oh, yeah, yeah. thing it's like women don't write songs it's so strange but and that's where it's, I, I don't know sometimes it's felt easy for me to go like oh i'm a poet and then i put it to music but I don't I, I'm a songwriter and I like I think all lyrics are poetry I suppose mm. the lines really blur for me also like things like my one line like th thought things that I do on I started out calling them reminders like because they were like it was it was I just daft kind of thing yeah so I've good. never thought of them in poetry until people started to tell me that that was poetry I was like all right then <laughs> but then I did date a poet for a while and I was like oh, that isn't poetry <laughs> and I was like okay great yes, okay so it. <laughs> and I'd be like my city my city never sleeps <laughs> my city I was like if I say it like that is it poetry like but yeah I think it's all blown. microwave fair enough for my laughing <laughs> but, uh yeah so I, I can't remember the question well I think we we went on the tangent of grievances <laughs> no, but I think the that's, industry that's amazing I mean like so Ooh, that I'm, is a I'm thinking about like Kate Bush's work you know in, in the 80s and how much that was kind of maligned especially when she started actually solo producing her own work in that sense and then I'm thinking even just back to like two three years ago when Bjork's Volnikura album came out and it was co-produced co with Arca and everyone that was writing about it was saying Arca has produced this amazing Bjork album and then Arca himself is like why are you discredited crediting oh. Bjork she did yeah. like all this work all production as well I don't know if, the, if, if you felt like this but I'm like it, everything I've made is a co-produce definitely like I don't say I've, I've never gone I don't care what any of the sonics of this are <laughs> uh, here's the song you do what you will with it man like it, it yeah. drives me mad I think but, the first time I took a co-production credit I realised that oh I've been <laughs> doing like, this uh, for ages and now I feel like I have to sh shout oh god you do it. though and, and that sometimes I think I feel like I'm for years I was like, oh, you sound bitter or crazy or like whatever. But you know, like uh, when I was at school and, and a, a teacher would ask a question and then you put your hand up and you'd be, I used to be like, 
something like this and they obviously didn't pick me because they were sick of me but if I and I remember thinking if I knew the so if they pick another kid and the kid got it right and that was what I was going to say I used to think right just make your peace with the fact that you knew it the answer and that's, that's how I feel about this so I'm like well I know I write the songs I know that I produce the songs I know my back catalogue is mine so that's all that needs to be that's do you know all what it's matters. weird because I've kind of come to that same piece because for the big do you, do you know what happened is that there's also like I got so worried about people thinking that I am um, like didn't do enough of the writing or did it like because it makes you like it makes you ashamed to even like collaborate mm -hmm. it's because you think which is a terrible thing because music is all collaboration and there's an interesting thing that that tom york said in an interview which is like no solo artist is actually a solo artist if they're really honest which is totally true and all, so much of florence the machine is about s a collaboration with friends and the people i love and i want to celebrate that but for this record i got so worried about people not taking me seriously as a writer that i was like no i'm shutting myself in a room i'm going to do as much as about as I can, just on my own, and I and I really, I really did, and a lot of it was <laughs> it was definitely to like impress maybe one journalist who <laughs> has had like a bugaboo with me for ten years, and I was like, Do you know what? If I go and co-produce it and write so much of the bulk of it myself, like he'll like take me seriously, and then they put the album out, and I'm so proud of it, and then I was like. Oh, wait, he does take me seriously. He just doesn't like it at all. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever feeds the creative machine. Fine. That's also very self-esteem. <laughs> I was like, oh, it's not that he doesn't take me seriously. An artist who just doesn't like it. And he never has. Oh, and really? he never will. Yeah. <laughs> but that was kind of a relief in itself when you're like, oh, you don't have to get everyone to like you. And then if you know within you that you like, mm -hmm. you did the best. Mm -hmm. Best thing. <laughs> that you did the best that you could. <laughs> That's all you can do. Exactly. And that, it's so yeah. petulant that song. I'm like, <laughs> I'm just done now. I'm tired. But that's how I. That's how I feel. Like getting older is so magical because that more and more each day that feeling just uh, goes. It, with my work as well, I'm like, ah, oh, I just I. I don't have to prove much more now. Yeah, um, and I feel kind of safe to collaborate again. And to it like, is a dangerous thing, though, isn't it? Because you're like, because yeah. I've been like screwed with percentages and all that oh, sort of yeah, stuff, yeah, and, yeah. and that that broke my heart. Because you get scared. You yeah. get scared to even like go into yeah, yeah. a room with people. But I know, and I know artists like who write the big pop songs who figure it out before they go it into the room, Such which is the point. which is like so. Yeah, it's so odd. But yeah, that stuff will like crush. Mm. creativity yeah and you're right about um well going being a solo artist like i crafted that sound with one person and who you know i'm fully open to saying that he is part of it but i couldn't bear the idea that people didn't think i wrote it and 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 i suppose in a way like that's why the lyrics might like that i'm doing now i'm like so like you can't dispute it that it's me <laughs> all of this has just been so like it's, it's, it's very self esteem <laughs> but do you think that applies actually to both of you that you write quite personal lyrics yeah, well, and I so actually be. to take ownership is is so important well I think it, yeah for, for me I think my insecurity was that I wasn't a musician which is that I could be like a writer and a performer I mean oh, it's difficult like it's even in the, like my dad said that my dad said to me like the other day like oh well, you're a singer aren't you and oh. and I just was like oh god like I had no chance <laughs> I, know how you know, I, I was like oh I've got no chance you know but what is wrong with that as well but I think when I feel still feel like oh say hello little wasp friend oh, but, um <laughs> Live on I love, air, I love nature. Of <laughs> um, World exclusive. Uh, but yeah, when you feel like you even have to explain to your family like what you do, you realise that it's just so. It feels sort of almost too big to 
to to exhausting yeah. to have to go back and keep reiterating everything. So I'm like, okay, fine. Totally. <laughs> um, but um, with, I mean, with, yeah, it's, weirdly the lyrics have got more personal over time, I think for me, because um, I was trying to push the boundaries of what I thought pop music could be. And especially with a song like Hunger, I didn't think you were allowed to put that stuff in a pop song. And I thought that was quite interesting to me uh, as almost like an experiment of what pushes sort of beyond the parameters of what we're used to hearing in like, or what's essentially like quite an upbeat, like big sort of pop song uh, and the juxtaposition of those themes and definitely as I've gotten older as well, pushing what you, it's just like, what haven't I heard before? What wouldn't, what wouldn't someone else do that I then, that I should, means I should do it. So I those think about those things definitely. So like where I'm at now, it's like, I can't not, I don't think, say really personal things that aren't like radio one friendly. Like, and I had dreams of, self-esteem being like it'll cross over straight away and I'll be like huge and it hasn't happened and then and, and then now I'm like oh of course it fucking hasn't like you can't <laughs> say what I'm saying and this is it's a different ball game as you mm. all know like to to go I mean it's like I'm 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 trying to work out uh, experimenting too like I've written you know I've written a pop song where I'm like right I'm not going to say anything that will w- that oh, I'd be really interested yeah. to hear. Well, I'd, I hate it. I'll send it to you. Because it's like, I don't hate it, but I'm like, this isn't me. I don't know, though. I'd I've love- definitely done that, especially on the first two records. I haven't had to make that much compromises in terms of what I've put out, but I was on a major label. So there was definitely like, there's always there's like there's two, there's like always a couple of songs like two songs especially from the first few records which I'm like that is terrible. <laughs> well, it's that like because, put a la 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 because, in, because they were like this is going to be a big pop hit and it's a ballad and it soars and I'm like it's awful. Really? Yeah, <laughs> it, it, um, it's awful. But I sort of was more easily slightly pushed, you know, because yeah. your first two and you're like, oh, maybe I don't know. Yeah, yeah, and you. It's this funny thing, isn't it? You have, when you've went, but I don't think you should lose this because you can get sort of, you know what you're doing. And the first couple of songs that I wrote are still some of my biggest hits. And that was with no one giving me any, no one had any say in anything. And then a couple of ones where the labels were like, this is the one, like you should keep pursuing this song because like we love it. I'm like, they're in the bin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I never play them. I don't want to yeah. listen to them. There are probably some people out there's favourite songs, so I won't mention well, yeah. what, <laughs> like what they are. I'm fascinated with it, though. Like, what makes it... But even last night at, um, at your show, like, your audience, it's, like, huge. And I'm looking at them. And then when we clap in a song, the audience clap along. And I'm like, well, okay, so huge audiences. They just love to clap along. Like, no matter, no matter what, that's a universal thing. And I'm like, oh... I could play a game, you know what I mean? Like a, you can tick a box and probably, and but then the real stuff, what I'm getting though. to though is like, look at your success and you've not really, you've never done that. It's like, it's possible. I'll show you a couple of songs <laughs> where I have, but I refuse to play them now and I won't even say their names. But you know, you can with like, I was saying to you guys well, earlier, like within, on the last two records, I made no compromises mm. and they're the happiest yeah. that I've been. Yeah. It it real is real like real will win out and I think especially today and what the world we're in now I, I yeah I don't I think this is such a place for for being true and honest and, and not playing a game. So you'll find your people you'll find yeah, your people it's and, happening, yeah. And it's also that you just get to walk through the world with much more of a sense of ease if you know that your creative output is a reflection of who you really are. Yeah. And it and I mean there is a lot to be said for mainstream success because it offers you so many like opportunities, but you can like it, if you if it then takes away your internal compass or your sense of self it's a it's a difficult life, you know. It you might have success, but 
it could drive you fucking yeah. mad. I'll find a new thing to <laughs> be, be mad about if I, if I had it. So like, yeah, some days I'm like, I want to be huge. And then I'm like, nah, I'm, I'm good. I'm just, at, and it's created, it, finally doing it solo and it's a full representation of me. It's just, I've noticed now like after shows, I'm like, I can go home. Like I don't need to go out, drink a thousand beers and tell people who I am and be the funniest person in the room and all that kind of thing. Like now I'm like, and I'm done. It's like, it's changed, it's life changing to express yourself truly and yeah, I don't know why I'm, how I've gone to this. But that's but yeah. what it feels like to me when I see you up on stage. It just feels so <clears throat> confident and joyful. And that's what the album sounded like. I mean, it's my favourite album. It's incredible. So I don't think you should doubt anything that you're doing. And people <laughs> will catch up. Don't just, yeah. you keep forging your path. And yeah, yeah. totally. I'm, and I, and I'm, I am doing. I am. I am. I am. It's great. I have the best time. <laughs> I'm literally buzzing for tonight. Can't yes. Wait. Um, I actually want to backtrack a little bit. So we were talking, airing our grievances and talking about sort of um, how women who create work aren't necessarily taken as seriously and things like that. And I wanted to actually talk about something that I noticed that you two have in common, which is your self-esteem's Believe Women t-shirts and the refrain in Patricia, I believe her, I believe her, I believe her, which I took on a new kind of life, I think. Certainly, I saw it written on protest signs during the Brett Kavanaugh hearings when Dr. Uh, Christine Blasey Ford was, you know, testifying so boldly and so just courageously, I thought. And I just wondered actually if we could talk a little bit about this idea of believing women and reading women and listening to women artists and, you know, kind of prioritizing the female voice in a world where actually it's very often neglected or outright silenced. Yeah, it, that was one of the craziest things because we were in Washington as that as the, the Cavana hearings were taking place. And um, so we had two shows that night and like, and obviously the hearing went the way that it went. And there were, like, I was singing that, I didn't, I wrote that song before any of this mm. happened. Mm. It was being reported on that I had written it off the cuff. Like, just knocked it up. Yeah, I was like, no, I wrote, I wrote it before. Um, and it was from a quote by Patti Smith, um, which was that all doors are open to the believer. And, um, but yeah, we were in DC and we were playing two shows back to back. And yeah, that day they were, they were just young. I, I was singing that song and I, I mean, it seems sort of dramatic even for me, but I just was, I felt tears just like falling because looked at this front row of young women and they were all crying at the barrier and I couldn't it was so um it's 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 funny like it's yeah it's been it's crazy I don't know how that happened with this record but a lot of the things um like it was I didn't write like and women that line from a hundred years as well as as women raged as old men fumbled and cried we're sorry we thought you didn't care how does it feel now you've scratched that itch and pulled out all your stitches hubris is a bitch and um, that was written like around 2016 um, and it but it wasn't it it was weirdly I didn't know any of this was about to go down so it's that strange thing a, you know weirdly prescient quality that it talk about an useless magic and so that song took on this totally um new meaning and I was glad to have it I was glad to have it in the show like it has become quite a central focus in the show but that wasn't my intention really when I wrote it I was I mean there is a there is a very pointed message in the middle of Patricia, which is this sense that people, especially, you know, in patriarchal systems, there is this grasping for power at any cost, you know, like get get yours, no matter like what happens and and take take what you want you know and um so that was in that song there was a kind of 
there is my love for Patti Smith and then my sort of despair as well, all within the same song. I was The reason I started explaining what it was is that I was really wanted to be really clear that that bit in the middle wasn't anything to do with her. Because yeah. I love her so much and I'd worried she'd watch it and be like, what is this crazy yeah. angry <laughs> bit in the middle? Like, what did I do to you? I was like, no, no. You can just read the lyrics. And I think it's very clear what you're sort of segueing into. And, you know, the word choice, I think, is very potent as well mm. uh, take as much as you can grab with two hands well I mean we all can guess where that came from <laughs> yeah but, but that's the thing and it's I think it's clear enough to read to hear um, yeah and I think it, it does have that embedded in it even though it's you know, like like we said sort of taken on that new life it's there it was already kind of yeah it's, it's like seeds. everything sort of, the political goes through a poetic filter with me and and I find it easier to express it's kind of, it kind of goes into the songs and into the shows. I've always found it easier to like express things that way rather than perhaps through like social media or that like to put my anger into the songs. It, it yeah, that's how I kind of process things like that. But um, yeah, it's funny how they change. And but yeah, that was a very quite specific. Uh, fuck <laughs> you know you couldn't be writing a record which i was around the time of 2016 and just not be so affected by everything so a lot of the smatterings of the lyrics were reflections on that time and like what we were all going through and the sort of collective sense of confusion and despair um yeah, just that ho hopelessness of it which i know we were sort of saying is is something to fight against but that that trial like even you saying her name gives me goosebumps because i just it just embodied what i think just so many people have been through in different various forms of severity but the the that feeling of there is no point because you will never win because they will find a way to silence you especially with like sexual assault stuff with men in, who are powerful like it just hits a nerve that I can't like bear and uh but fuels me and I make I'm making lots of work about it and I'm doing this national youth thing with like 30 girls who are like 20 like all, all 24 and below kind of thing and they're the way they talk it's it's so exciting because they they've had the access to like feminism and and, and equality bef before like I did obviously and that doesn't make sense like I'm just excited for like women young women now who've got like 10 years on me of like knowledge I'm so impressed by young women and how switched on they are and how aware they are of what's going on in the world and when I was like 20 I was like drunk and up yeah. a tree and, and trying yelling to, like, get boys to like and me. like yeah, like, yeah I had no I think I probably had no idea like well, I mean, we didn't have the technology that they have. That's what it is. It's the now. access, yeah. And although there are like, issues with it, obviously, with anxiety, I think everyone, like, is just so much more aware of what's going on. And I find it so... Um, that was a, like... The hunger as well was a sort of... Was a... Um, some of the lyrics in there were directly about these incredibly... these Like, yeah, these extraordinary young women who I would just see like radiating this sense that they felt like they had much more, they could take up space. Mm -hmm. And they were so much more confident in themselves and in in their abilities in the world than I felt I did at that age. And it's really inspiring. Yeah, so like I, I'm obsessed with like the idea that it'll work with the feel sort of like, it's, it's funny we're like the same age, like born in, it's like I feel like the last generation that just didn't quite get told like you you can be anything you want and you <laughs> I well I definitely still it was like uh marriage baby's house kind of thing was was the narrative certainly in Yorkshire you know like or just I, I have this weird thing like, that being somebody's girlfriend was like the most oh, imp it, yeah. the most important thing <laughs> yes, that you and that was my so I was like well I want to do music but ov obviously like I want to be a girlfriend of somebody That's in a band sometimes more. I, I go through that in my tummy and I go oh a relationship um, 
no no <laughs> like we're we've we've that's not where we are anymore like and but it's still inside my bones of like msn or like <laughs> like trying to having pen pals i'm I at interpol gigs my best friend at school i feel so bad about this best friend at school we had to write like little blurbs for each other's like end of year books and she wrote she's such a, she's still my best friend sad of she's called sad sack um she was the most beautiful girl in school but she's so miserable um she's the best um and she wrote this she's such a good writer and even at that age she wrote me this gorgeous peak like little i mean you don't need to write a good thing for the fucking yearbook but she wrote this beautiful thing but didn't include the fact that, that i'd had a boyfriend at that point and i was devastated i was like why didn't you include that i have a boyfriend now (laughs) that's really what i need not that i'm kind of a funny exciting person no (laughs) people need to know that somebody fancied me enough to go out with me (laughs) isn't that crazy yeah it really like makes me feel so what was in like the media that made us feel like that at that time it's a specific cacophony isn't it of like the whatever we have if you look back at even it was interesting I watch friends to go to sleep mm-hmm. but I look back at it now with sort of these eyes and it's interesting other people have said it is that every girl is just obsessed with like marriage mm-hmm. and babies and and, and like more like cleaning yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like I love that show but yeah. there's yeah or I'm, and I don't. I mean, I guess it is in culture. Like it's oh god, Sex and City. Sex isn't and it? City, yeah. and we that was kind of like what we sort of had was were those and things. all the nineties rom coms as and well. Rom coms and that Heat magazine. I mean, the thing that I think still happens, which makes me feel so sad, which I don't see it as much, but is like the weights of celebrities. I can remember that quite. And it like I find it harrowing. Like, if I pass a newsstand and there's someone be getting bikini shamed, I almost want to be like, "How? How is this happening still?" But that's what I've noticed with these girls because I've uh, that I'm in the room with every day for a week, and they're so that's so far from there. Yeah, it's amazing. I'm like, yeah, that oh, was kind of yes. What the f- you make a fool of death with your beauty? That line was kind yeah. of for for them, yes. like. Don't let anyone tell you that you're not like so vibrant and alive and yeah, yeah, I feel that it gives me a lot of hope yeah. that stuff that they that they wouldn't find that acceptable and that things are having to change because a younger generation are coming forward and being like, Hey, that it's not and then we're all like, Oh yeah, it's not. Okay. Yeah. It's yeah. a real revelation. I've still I'm being reborn often still where I go, <gasps> whoa yeah that's what that was about when I was 21 and no one was sort of guiding me through I used to get so n- nervous because I've had quite you know I've had my uh, drunk years and I used to get like so nervous about being like I mean it's been quite a long time now so if anyone was going to write a piece about how crazy I was I'd be like you are late yeah. <laughs> like, this <laughs> is so late this coming. is not news yeah it's like and i don't know what else you could say that i haven't told everyone <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, that's why i do it <laughs> yeah. but i do think also within that like um the culture shifted whereas before to write like a shaming piece about a woman or say that like oh she like slept with this person, da, 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 was very accept like yeah. accepted yeah and we were like oh okay like that's just something that happens to you and i think now almost you it's almost like women have come together and are now i feel like if that hap- if that happened to me to me it feels like there's an army of women behind you who would be like no that's not okay and i think that's really changed and you can feel it like you feel a safety because so many women are coming forward and are refusing to be shamed and are refusing to be silenced and it's a really amazing thing i think about it so often like if something dreadful happened to me and i live myself my life so openly sexual and so who i am um and it's like i'm so obsessed with making sure that the shame aspect about female sexuality is it goes like it probably not going to be in my lifetime but like that's what I'm, i mean the bloody t-shirts are about it's like you you have a right 
to do whatever you want. And that does not mean someone can non-consensually sort of touch you. But that has helped, you don't understand, like, that is helping so much. And it's helped, it's helped, like, this movement has helped me, especially having been, like, a blackout drinker and, you know, like, done a lot of stuff that still, like, today I go, oh, but it's actually, like, helped me absolve so much of that shame. To be like, that guy, or, like, that guy was equally drunk, and he's not walking away feeling, like, a shame. And, like, why do I have mm-hmm. to? But, yeah, you, I think it's, it really is, like, ha- you, ha- like, have to keep doing it. It helps so much. And even, like, I'm maybe not as outspoken about this stuff, but in my personal life and my own private things that I wrestle with, it helps me. Yeah. And that's what it does for women. Like it helps me every day. And actually, so this year with your shelf, we've made it sort of year of the woman, which is a bit of a sort of wishy-washy thing anyway, because it's not really just women, but people who aren't cis men, you know what I mean? Um, in terms of just including those sorts of voices and writers in our bundles and things like that. Um and it's been great, actually. I, I was sort of inspired to do that by Lauren Groff when she wrote a really great um, by the book column for the New York Times. And she sort of pointed out that all the, I say all, most of the sort of male writers who get asked to write this column when they're talking about books that made them and books that, you know, everyone should read, they list books by men. And, you know, fair enough if that is, if those are the books that made you, but at what point are you just sort of excluding female writers and you're not sort of by not telling people about them and by not including them in that dialogue you're kind of keeping them in the margins and you're not opening anyone's sort of uh, avenues to that kind of stuff yeah I get really like when there's always those like hundred greatest albums thing Mm -hmm. and just how little women there are in there it's so you have to go so far down the list oh god yeah so you're just like oh I get into arguments all the time because there's sites I mean there are so many like incredible yeah like the icons I get it but they also came up at a time when women's voices were so silent yeah. that we don't even know what women yeah, who could have been, been coming him, yeah. forward and making extraordinary music because th- they wouldn't have had the opportunity to do that so yeah but yeah the 100 greatest albums of all time it's like you, yeah you have to scroll I like I recently did so, that I like had like an oh hour gosh. I was alone like eating alone I was like I'm gonna listen to what is like the greatest album and yeah it took me I scrolled and scrolled and scrolled and I was like okay I'll listen to Prince <laughs> because I was like that's the closest I can get to like some sort of not like straight up like masculine <laughs> like you know uh, it's crazy. It's but you get it. It's in, in all the arts. Exactly. Yeah. There's no. I, there's nothing where women are first in line. Yeah. F- for it, is there? Um, cake baking. Cake. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't and know. Tell all that to Paul Hollywood. <laughs> and they're winning the bloody bake off, <laughs> taking our cake baking crowns. <laughs> oh. oh God. God's sake! <laughs> well, I was going to be able to compete. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're not even allowed to eat the cake. Oh, cool. <laughs> oh, awesome. Just have to make it <laughs> and then sit quietly. Oh, God. <laughs> Wait to sleep. <laughs> well, I, I was going to say, I get quite a kick actually just on Instagram seeing you recommend Self Esteem's album, seeing you recommend Kelsey Liu, Little Sims, mm-hmm. you know, these sorts of really great female artists who are making really kind of like pioneering work and really kind of putting there themselves was also as this female. weird idea when I was first coming up that you all had to be like, in competition oh, yeah, with yeah, each yeah. other. Oh yeah, but that's and still there. there could be only there, like yeah. one woman. Yeah, at, at <laughs> all, just one. Yeah. There could be all these male musicians, but just the one. But in those early indie lady. days, they that was hard to. I certainly used to be like, uh, which I would never be now. But like it, we were, you were pitted up against each other, and uh, it's just he- it's a he- it's awful, and it's perpetuated. And then like if you're like got insecurities like I have like and you've not <laughs> I wasn't just hadn't had enough access to enough books uh like eh, thinkers like anything uh so like 19 year old me in the indie clubs I was a right dick like <laughs> I, it's uh, I, pains that's more I've got more shame about that than I have any but like it's one night sounds I've heard at, in there was such especially I think probably when we were coming at there weren't that many women like you would could be the only woman on a bill like, over yeah. and over and over again so I 
like all like all the people I hang out with were men, basically, because it was all like men in my band. If you were on a bill with people, it would all be guys. So you do kind of like you. There's not much female solidarity around you, and it's something that you really well. I had Isa. I always had Isa, so that was good. But um, but we were sort of like blokes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah, I feel it now though so much, and it it's one of my favorite things about self esteem going solo is like a, a true sisterhood, and it's not based on uh it's not false like and it's it's the, the greatest joy i'm getting from not just my band like the connection with you like and, and quite a lot of other female artists have gone who i've known through the years have got in touch and gone i fucking love this like and it's it's because you've I don't, it's, it's 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 everything it's the movement it's it's the way we feel it's it, it's it, and me being able to go ah oh, it's not competition Florence, what is your favorite self-esteem lyric? And oh yes, back to okay, you there's so well. many that spoke to me. One that I like feel so deeply to my core. And there's nothing left to say. I'll make it hard for myself somehow, anyway. That is, I was like, oh, she knows me. <laughs> uh, I also felt very very deeply and this one kind of made me emotional was um what i might have achieved if i hadn't been trying to please i was i need that is so true and it's so something that we all need to hear especially as women to be like okay so yeah that those two are really profound strong choices yeah <laughs> um oh i'm just currently obsessed with what kind of man loves like you because i'm 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 so I'm writing for the next record and I'm writing I'm just obsessed with the idea that like I don't know if this is my take from it but like the the men that get those songs that song is unreal uh, but he doesn't deserve it because he's like, <laughs> like and I never write about the ones that deserve to have an iconic beautiful incredible piece of art about them yeah. he wasn't happy about it <laughs> no, well, okay good it said his purpose then. it didn't make him feel good but that idea that like he I love still says to me he's like I just want a bit on your show where I can come up and tell my side <laughs> of the story because and you know what, he's, I mean, to be honest, like, he's actually a really, really decent person. And I think I was going through a lot at that time that I pinned on him. <laughs> he, he, he definitely is a, a bad guy. No, but the, the uh, I guess, yeah, the, but the idea of the dangling and the, and the, just all of that song is so. I've never, I could never write a, a song about someone who's nice to me. No, <laughs> me neither. I, oh my, she reigns, it's like, my partner was amazing. Um, but I still managed to flip that and go like, <laughs> oh, uh, you've had enough of me though, poor me. <laughs> and, like, I, and like, It's really funny. No Choir is, uh, is kind of one of the ones where I'm trying to explore. Why do I write about this like, that nice was, moment? That was the other lyric I was going to say. The, the opening line of that is, is so, uh, it, as, as a sort of parallel to that, it's like I understand that desire to go, how do I say I'm I'm all right? Like, I, and everything is just sort of quiet and still, um, and because there's beauty in that, as proved by that song. But it's just not as fruitful or as fun, is it? It's oh, right. <laughs> and it's a, it's like what came first, like the chaos or the creativity, and and I, I did sort. I got although that was such a painful experience that relationship. Like I got a whole record from it that was really proud of um and yeah when i was trying to write about a peaceful moment it's a totally what like my life is i mean i've started to write again but it is mainly poems and it's stuff that maybe is like less to do with me but I did write a song recently about the desire to explode my life for creative purposes which is there all the time mm -hmm. where i was like oh if I could just like create something, yep. it would make for really good material. Yep. <laughs> it's harder and harder to put your body through that though. For me, I'm like, I, I, I need to wind this up now. I need to, I do, I can't live like this much longer, right? <laughs> Full disclosure. <laughs> but uh, 
but it there is that idea in my head that like well then what would I say but I've I've always thought I swear I'm not doing it on purpose for the creative juice or whatever they made a documentary about slow club and there's this bit in it where the documentary maker goes do you think you go looking for pain Rebecca and I'm like <laughs> no <laughs> yeah <laughs> I was like oh <laughs> shit I hate that though but for, for like constantly for me it's always there's no middle ground it's like either full mm. force like chaos or bored stagnancy and it's like finding a middle ground where I can there will be one like but can I ask actually is is there music literature anything that really interestingly explores either that middle ground or even just being happy that's is that part of the problem no I, do you know what I think there is one M, like M Train, although she is dealing with her grief around the loss of Patti Smith, there is a sort of meditative exploration of daily life in all of its everyday glory that I find really inspiring. And it's all about the beauty that comes with a favorite cafe and a coffee and in, like enjoying being alive, not for its extremes, but just because it's sort of a gift to wake up every morning and get to drink coffee and to go for a walk and and although she's dealing with big feelings and it's kind of a walk through her life after she lost her husband the reverence that she applies to everyday things and the poetic beauty she gives to the everyday is a co is a constant inspiration for me on how to live a sustainable creative life and i i mean i love knowing people's like daily habits and and i love routine and I'm really trying to find a way to um, start writing that is not just tied up in my own personal dramas, but I'm so self-obsessed. So Same, no, but, but there's a way to do both. Like, I'm sure, yeah, there must be. I'm trying. I, the next album's going to be awful. You're going to have to do <laughs> one of those things that a lot of boys do, uh, where it's like, I'm writing this from the perspective of a yeah, uh, I think French uh, busker. Maybe <laughs> I don't. Yeah, I'm thinking oh, maybe I have to do a um, concept album. Yeah, my girlfriend is damaged but beautiful. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, a concept album about spaceships. I, mean, I would listen to that. <laughs> you can do Babylon Sorceress. The record I will give oh you that. God, thank and you. We for can talk percentages early. Babylon Sorceress. <laughs> <It's> <gasps> oh my I need God, to that's the it. We found it. Yeah. Here. Well, look, if you need it, it's there, okay? <laughs> okay, this is, or like, something to do with Atlantis or something. Yeah, the worm. Bring the worm back. <laughs> Bring that big the old dune, dune worm. worm. <laughs> People, I would like to, you're like, your, your back catalogs is, you know, you've made your point of who you are, your but statement that, of intent is less than enough. This is also could, the thing that I'm confused now, is now I feel like I really have made my statement of intent. I'm not quite sure what's next, so... You can Babylon, do anything. It's like, yeah, Babylon it's sorceress who rides the dune yeah, worm the under the sea. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I'm still angry like about my ex, so <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a couple more albums of that. Yeah. Milk it for as long as we can. Yeah. <laughs> I will still stream every single one. <laughs> and what are you each currently reading, if anything? Or what was the last thing that you read and would you recommend it? Um I'm actually reading uh Ocean Vong's uh, On Earth were briefly gorgeous. Yeah, that's a brilliant book. And Your Shelf gave me a collection of Ocean's poetry. And uh, yeah, as I mentioned to you, I was becoming a lot more interested in, in trying to read um, trans writing, queer writing, and um, found some amazing poetry about the trans experience uh, that I recommended to you actually what is that what did i give you um was it rika aoki rika aoki yeah. yes dust why dust shall never why settle. dust shall never settle on the soul and her manifesto at the beginning of it is one of the most beautiful things i've read on the subject of poetry writing did you read sorry did you read that before or after high as hope and useless magic I read it after because someone actually said to me the other day like oh you can see the influence of that on useless magic and i'm like i swear she read it after yeah no yeah. i found it afterwards um and yeah no i found it afterwards and but yeah there's i think uh, but yeah, On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous is um, 
yeah, it's it's so stunning so far. I, I would recommend both of those books. I think that, yeah, basically there's like a lot of, um, a lot of my fans, uh, we have like a strong trans community, we have a strong queer community and I want to connect with them deeper and that's the most beautiful thing about books is in seeking to empathise and to understand there's always literature out there where you can go so that you can feel you know, although you don't, have not lived the experience, you can see it through someone's eyes, and and I think that is the most amazingly powerful thing about books. So I want I wanted to kind of be with my fan base more. And and Rebecca, what about you? Um, um, well, I just did the terrible the years. Uh, yeah, there's a penultimate sort of chapter in that that just like lit me on fire, and um. And it was really, I'm a, I'm a bit stuck. Uh, I don't know if you do this, but like, I can't get up every day and write. Like, I have to just wait oh, for it to happen. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. No. Uh, it's uh, on my phone in moving around yeah, places. Yeah. So, so I'm a little bit like waiting for the shot of like adrenaline to get to go. Um, and it'll come. Although sometimes I think, maybe that's it now. <laughs> maybe that's I like all think, I'm done. in that stage now as well. As I said to my manager, I was like, I don't think I'll ever write a song again. <laughs> but you will. <laughs> Obviously. No, and as soon, <laughs> yeah. but as soon as I say I'm done, this, oh, as soon as I'm too exhausted, I'm not doing any more, and a good way to stop touring is to just not write any more songs, and I won't make an album. And as soon as I tell them I'm done... Yeah them by them i'm talking to the songs because i think of them like creepy children yeah. <laughs> and as soon as i tell them they're done literally it's how they're like we're back we're back and then i'll get this flood of songs i'm like no leave me alone no told you it's finished they're like hello they're like come kind of creeping like into my bed so that's, so that's why in therapy yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you therapy um yeah, but the way she writes really like it sort of got me off my ass a bit because it's poetic and but so um, uh, yeah, I can you can taste it and smell it like it really I just just blew me away. I'm kind of late to the party, but I like oh, it was it was phenomenal. I thought. So thank you very much to Rebecca of Self Esteem and Florence of Florence and the Machine. Thank you both so much for coming. Thanks for oh, having us. Band names rhyme. Oh, our first day. Fated. It feels like you know on Undateables where they have a chaperone. <laughs> it's like we've been set up finally and you curated it, so thank you. <laughs> my dad said, I was at 13, and my dad was like, well, I found you a skateboard, actually. There was, like, one up in the countryside. So I'll bring it down. I told all my friends, like, my dad's dad's got a skateboard for me. He's like, great. And when he, when, it, when he did bring it down, it, it was plastic and in the shape of a fish. <laughs> <laughs> and it had oh, these no. huge wheels. I was like, not cool, oh, what Dad. Is <laughs> what this is, is rubbish. <laughs> if you want to hear some of the stuff that Florence, Rebecca and I talked about after our interview, you can access over 20 minutes of bonus content, including a game of celebs read nice tweets and our phone in question round by becoming a Your Shelf patron. If you want to know what Florence or Rebecca would write about in their debut novel or hear some of Florence's style tips, support us on patreon.com slash your shelf to hear it. Self-Esteem has just released her latest single, In Time, which has the most gorgeous lilac music video I've ever seen, and she'll also be on tour in the UK throughout October. Her album, Compliments Please, is available to buy and stream online. Stream, self-esteem, stream, self-esteem, stream, self-esteem. Head to selfesteem.love for links to all of these things and more. Florence, whose latest tour for her 2018 album, High as Hope, wraps up later this month at the Acropolis in Athens, has just released the 10th anniversary edition of her debut album, Lungs, which you can find online and at all good music retailers and stream on Apple Music and Spotify. Her book, Useless Magic, is available online and in most bookstores.
Some of the books we discussed in our first episode include Rebecca Solnit's essays, Hope in the Dark, the books of Jacqueline Wilson, Frank Herbert's Dune, Women Who Run with the Wolves by Clarissa Pinkola Estes, the Margaret Atwood classic The Handmaid's Tale, Patti Smith's M Train, Ocean Vuong's stunning debut novel On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous, Rika Aoki's book of poems Why Dust Shall Never Settle Upon the Soul, and Yursa Daly Ward's memoir The Terrible. If you're looking for more recommendations, our current guest curated title chosen by the Your Shelf community is Gia Tolentino's incredible Trick Mirror Reflections on Self Delusion. A few other books I'd like to take a second to recommend Julia Armfield's short story collection Salt Slow, and R.J. Arkhipov's Visceral The Poetry of Blood, which were given to Florence at the recording, and Mary Jean Chan's Flesh, which was given to Rebecca. My favourite read in August was Lucy Ellman's groundbreaking Booker Prize longlisted Ducks Newburyport, which I started reading in Edinburgh and haven't been able to get out of my head since I finished it. It's the definitive novel on violence and contemporary culture in America, and one of the best novels ever written. I'd like to thank Florence and Rebecca for making this absolute dream of a first episode a reality and generously giving their time to answer these questions. Thanks also to Team Florence and the Machine and Team Self-Esteem for all your help in bringing this together. Thanks to our stressed out Uber driver for the unintentional laughs. Thanks to anyone whose brain I have picked in the lead up to this podcast and to the Your Shelf community for being so excited about our podcast and so supportive for over three years. Finally, thanks to my partner, David Maitland, the sound engineer behind the Your Shelf podcast and the all-around tech person at Your Shelf since day one.